evidence suggests that normal brain development is impaired in uh, schizophrenia and other neuropsychiatric disorders long before the onset of symptoms. So, you know, emerging genetics and other data intriguingly have been implicating immune molecules and immune-related pathways, raising many questions about the underlying biology. So we recently discovered an unexpected role for our resident immune cell called microglia in this sculpting process, this pruning process. And so today I'd like to tell you about what we've learned about how it is that these cells uh, know which synapse to prune and which cells, synapses perhaps not to prune, and how our work using mouse models are providing new biological insight into this pruning pathway and how this might go awry in schizophrenia and other neurodevelopmental disorders. Neural circuits undergo tremendous remodeling during development. We start out with an excess of synaptic connections. Um, and that are maintained in the mature brain. And through a developmental process called pruning or synapse elimination, many of these extra synaptic connections are permanently removed while others get strengthened and maintained. This, this concept of use it or lose it. So this process is, of course, regulated um, and, and modulated by experience. Um, and this process, refinement process, is necessary for developmental and the precise wiring of synapses in the brain. And disruptions in this process of pruning are thought to underlie neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric disorders. Now, interestingly, there are different critical periods of pruning that happen in different parts of the brain. And as you heard earlier today, interestingly, parts of the brain, like the frontal cortex, are the last areas of the brain to prune. So the big question, of course, is what regulates this pruning process? So a major question in the field, and one that my lab has been intensely interested in, is understanding how it is that specific synapses are eliminated during development. If we can understand the mechanisms by which specific synapses get pruned or vulnerable, this might provide new insight and even therapeutic insight into how these synapses get lost in disease. So it's well established, as you heard today, that neuronal activity plays a critical role in refining synapses and synaptic connections. So we know, for example, that activity sets up a local competition. So if you look at this cartoon here, you can see that this neuron is innervated by inputs from these left and right eye inputs. If you were to, for example, label these inputs into the visual system. But over the course of development, you can see that this neuron, that some of these inputs, in this case the blue ones, get permanently removed, while the red ones get strengthened and maintained. So what is the question mark that we're interested in is understanding what are the molecules that link change in activity that with a physical elimination of the blue input, but not the red one. So much of the field, of course, is focused on the neurons themselves. These are, in fact, the cells that get pruned. But emerging evidence implicate glia, the non-neuronal cells of the brain, in this pruning process. And more recent work have been implicating these cells called microglia. Now, as a card-carrying glial biologist, I have to say I've ignored these cells my entire career until very recently. And that is in part because these are the only cells not born in the brain. These are our immune cells. They actually now we know reside and are originating from the yolk sac. And they actually enter the brain very, very early in development. In fact, in a mouse, they enter the brain as early as embryonic day eight. That means they're the first non-neuronal cell in the brain. They're there when an amazing growth is happening in the embryonic brain. Yet we know surprisingly little about the normal roles of these cells. Much of what we knew about them was in the context of injury and disease. Now, these cells make up about 10% of the cells of the brain. They tile the brain. But one of the things that makes them incredibly unique and different from any other cell is there are resident phagocytes. They're actually, by nature, the fact that they're immune cells, they're really good at eating things or phagocytosing things. But the other thing that two-photon in vivo imaging has shown us, meaning if you were to put a microscope over a mouse's brain and thin, thin their skull and use a reporter line in which all the microglia are labeled green, what you can see is that these cells are incredibly dynamic. You can see the processes are constantly uh, moving all the time, and they're surveying the extracellular environment. And the big question we wanted to know is what is it that they're surveying? And one of the things we now appreciate that they're surveying are synapses. So if you were, to, for example, to overlay uh, neurons, in this case, this neuron is um, labeled in red, you can see the processes of these microglia intimately contacting spines and axons all the time. This is happening in your brain right now. 
It's amazing. And one of the things we also appreciate from our work and others is that they can even sense local changes in neuronal activity. So if you manipulate that neuron and you fire it more, or if you silence it, the microglia know somehow. And that suggests that there must be some sort of signals that are being transmitted and that the, the microglia have receptors that recognize those signals. So what about the postnatal brain when the, all of this remarkable plasticity is happening? What about early in development? So that is the question we set out to address a number of years ago. And we used the developing mouse visual system as our model because so much was known about how synapses prune in this particular part of the brain. And so we use the developing retina geniculate system of the mouse where you can actually uh, label the inputs from the two eyes with dye. And then we could ask, what are the microglia doing at that circuit during the critical period of pruning? And what you can see here is that the microglia in green are intimately associated with the left and right eye axons. And the question that Dory Schaefer in my lab addressed was, are they actually engulfing or eating those synapses? And what we found is that almost every microglia we surveyed during this peak of remodeling at this point were full of inputs from the left and the right eye. They were actually in their lysosomes. And quite importantly, this process of pruning was developmentally regulated. They were doing it during these critical periods of pruning, but not later. And that suggests that there must be some signals that tell the microglia to do this and other signals that tell the microglia to stop. And we're very much interested in understanding what those signals are. So the next big question, of course, is how is it that microglia know which synapse to prune? Now, we now appreciate that it's not a random process. You know, the first hypothesis is, well, they're phagocytes. They just happen to be there. And anything that's around, they're going to eat. But we know there were critical periods, again. And so that suggested the possibility that they were recognizing synapses through some molecules. So going back to that activity-dependent um, competition model, the red and the green, the red and the blue inputs, uh, if you change activity, we know that the less active inputs are selectively eliminated or more preferentially eliminated. And again, using the visual system, we could manipulate activity in the two eyes and block activity in one eye with a drug that blocks sodium-dependent action potentials. And what we found is that microglia preferentially engulf the axons from the less active eye. And that again tells us this is some activity-dependent cues. So how do microglia know which synapse to prune? Well, recent work, if we go back to work I did as a postdoc in Ben Barris's lab, back then we unexpectedly uh, identified a role for a group of immune molecules called complement in this process of synaptic pruning in the mouse visual system. Now this is a group of immune molecules traditionally associated with the innate immune system. And this was a surprising finding at the time, but what we essentially found is that the retinal ganglion cells, the cells, the cells that are actually getting pruned, are actually um, expressing some of these molecules like C1Q. And if you knock out C1Q and downstream C3, these mice fail to segregate into their eye-specific territories, and they remain multiply innervate even into adulthood. And so this raises this question of how is it that a group of secreted molecules that are related with the immune system could be doing something as precise as pruning? Well, going back to the immune system is where we learned a lot. Complement's main role in the immune system is to tag apoptotic cells and bacteria for rapid removal. So for example, C1Q would bind to that bacterial cell. This would set up a proteolytic cascade that then cleaves downstream components like C4, C2, C3. And the canonical way by which that cell would get removed is it would be get tagged by C3. And then a main way it gets removed is through phagocytes like macrophages in your periphery that express receptors for complement. And what we found is the complement was actually uh, tagging, if you will, um, subsets of synapses during development, and that microglia are the main cells that express this complement receptor. And that led to this hypothesis that microglia were recognizing complement tag synapses, maybe the less active synapses. And indeed, when we knocked out either the receptor on the microglia or complement itself, microglia are only about half as good as engulfing synapses. So this identifies complement as one of the main ways by which these synapses get pruned. But of course, that also tells you it's not the whole story. Now importantly, if you fail to prune through this mechanism, this led to sustained defects in synaptic connectivity. There were too many synapses. In fact, David Prince's lab later went on in the C1Q knockout mice to show that these mice remained multiply innervated and hyperconnected, and they were more, more prone to epilepsy, at least through the adolescent period. And that, of course, raises many questions we're actively investigating related to the functional and behavioral consequences of not enough pruning or too much pruning during development. And that now brings me to this question that this is one of many mechanisms by which synapses gets pruned. It's unexpected because it involves an immune cell and a group of these secreted immune molecules, but there's many other uh, lines of evidence now that are implicating both glia and other immune molecules like the MHC and the PRB. 
Now importantly, much like the immune system, this pruning pathway we've identified seems to be tightly regulated. Microglia do not continue to do this through life. There are, there are, there are times and places in which this is happening. They become less phagocytic as the animal matures. And a lot of these molecules like C3 are dramatically downregulated in the healthy brain. You'd not want to have pruning continuing all the time. But what if it did? What if it kept pruning? Or what if the breaks weren't there? Or what if something turned this pathway on too much? We hypothesize that this could lead to an excess or an inappropriate pruning of either the wrong synapse or too many synapses. And this could potentially uh, lead to some of the pathobiology um, underlying neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia. So this has been the question that we've been interested in for a very long time. But of course, as you know, there are not very many good animal models of schizophrenia, so it's been a very hard question to tackle. Now indeed, several lines of evidence suggest that synaptic pruning may be altered in schizophrenia. In fact, the pruning hypothesis put forth by Feinberg 40 years ago proposed that altered cortical pruning is critical to the development of the disease. And indeed, this, this classic study by David Lewis's lab shows, very intriguingly, a loss of spines in the prefrontal cortex of some individuals with schizophrenia. And, and imaging studies have also showed cortical thinning um, in patients even before the onset of symptoms. And putting this together, the pruning hypothesis is pretty attractive. However, it's not actually been directly demonstrated. We don't yet know, for example, in these patients, were these really a pruning defect? Were these lost or never formed? Was this cause or consequence? And again, this is very difficult to, to really tackle in, in, uh, in, in models because there really aren't any good animal models. Well, this, of course, is where human genetics can be extremely useful. And in the next few slides, I'd like to share with you new and recently published findings by my colleague Steve McCarroll and his graduate student, Ashwin Sekar, who have been using genetics to identify mechanisms and novel pathways for treatments. Now, the strongest uh, genetic signal by far has been on chromosome 6 in a region known as the MHC locus, which contains many genes, many of which relate to the immune system. But researchers had no idea which of these many genes contribute to risk. Now, this region spans hundreds of genes. Many of them, as I said, encode immune-related genes. But the um, MHC signal has really be remained unexplained. And really, it doesn't follow any mathematical or statistical patterns explainable by any one known genetic variant. So what could be explaining this effect? Well, intriguingly and interestingly, within the MHC, this one of the strongest risks are associated with loci near the gene C4, complement C4, which of course is a key part of the complement cascade I talked to you about earlier. Now, Ashwin honed in on this for that and other reasons. And he was also, in Steve's lab, has been interested in this question of, of structural variability, why different people have different numbers and copies of different genes. And they developed measure, uh, methods, molecular techniques, to characterize the C4 gene structure in human DNA samples. And quite interesting, what you'll see is there are actually two C4 genes, C4A and C4B. And unlike most genes, this gene has a high degree of structural variability, variation. And what he found is that some people's genomes have extra copies of A, some have extra copies of B, some have a completely lack one or the other. And this led Ashwin to ask, could the structural form of C4 you inherit, could this be in uh, related to the increased risk of schizophrenia? Now the challenge was that although the Ashwins developed these techniques to measure C4A and B and the variation in different individuals, you know, how do you, get, how do you link this to schizophrenia risk, right? So Ashwin and Steve developed a novel way to map how C4 structure relates to SNPs, right, or from which genetic data was already available from tens of thousands of, of individuals. They essentially built a map to infer the four most common forms of C4 from the SNP data surrounding the gene, which essentially created molecular barcodes from the SNP patterns. And it works because humans share long genomic segments that they have inherited from common ancestors. And this map then allowed them to take advantage of SNP data in giant beta databases from around around the world, which essentially turned a molecular biology problem into a big data problem. And here is what they found. Alleles of C4 appear to shape risk in proportion to their effect on C4A expression. On the left, which you'll see, is how each allele um, here uh, relates to schizophrenia risk. And you can see those that have more C4A have a significantly increased risk. On the right is each allele's effect on C4A expression in the brain. They found that C4 gene structure could predict C4 gene activity. And notice now that those that have C4A have more C4A expression. And together, I know I'm oversimplifying the story, which has been recently published earlier this year, but for now the important thing to realize is the more C4 you make from the locus, the greater the risk of schizophrenia.
Now that raises a number of questions that we're now actively investigating. Um, and we started to collaborate, Steve's lab with my lab and also Michael Carroll's lab, to ask this question, how is it that elevated C4A how does this contribute to the risk of schizophrenia? What, what is the biology underlying this, this risk factor? Now, this brought together my lab, which has been studying complement and pruning. Michael Carroll's lab is an immunologist who's been studying C4 for his career. And all of our labs together sort of joined forces in this multidisciplinary collaboration. And the first thing we did is we looked at the C4 protein. And there are actually a pretty good human antibodies for this. And we basically asked, much like we noticed in the mouse, could C4 be tagging synapses in the brain of humans? And we used tissue that was um, uh, generated and, and given to us by the Stanley Collection. And we looked in these brains and showed that C4 was, in fact, binding to subsets of synapses in the human brain uh, in schiz schizophrenia patients. Um, and then moreover, uh, Heather de Rivera in Steve McCarroll's lab grew cortical neurons and then stained them after they developed with C4 antibodies and shown that C4 also binds to these synaptic structures in cortical neurons. And interestingly and importantly, C4 is actually being made by the neurons and secreted by these human neurons. So this is just in, you know, early data to suggest that the protein is there, and it's actually binding to synapses, at least under these conditions. But of course, the big question is, is it related to pruning? So this is when we again went back to the mouse. So we went from human to mouse in this case, and we asked, does C4 mediate synaptic pruning? And so we went back to our very classic retinogeniculate system. We used mice that were generated by Mike Carroll's lab, these C4 knockout mice. And, and Allison Bialis, who was a graduate student with me and now a postdoc with Mike, did this experiment and basically did the eye specific segregation or pruning experiments in C4 knockout mice versus control. And the prediction would be that lacking C4 would lead to a, de a defect or, or lack of pruning, much like we saw in the C1Q and C3 mice. And that's exactly what we saw. And inter interestingly, the retinal ganglion cells were expressing a lot of C4 during the peak of pruning. So this is the presynaptic neuron. And mice that lack C4 fail to segregate nicely into these eye-specific territories, which you can actually label uh, by tracing the, the uh, left and right eye with cholera toxin and then doing this thresholding to show the two eye um, interactions. So this told us that lacking C4 led to failure to prune. But the big question now moving forward is could excessive pruning could contribute to the pathobiology of schizophrenia? Could this relate to the David Lewis's study? And so that is actually what we're now together as a collaboration actively investigating. Could overactivation of complement during these critical periods of pruning contribute to wiring defects in schizophrenia? A number of other questions were raised that we're actively uh, pursuing as well. And one of the questions that, again, stemmed from beautiful work presented earlier today, could pruning also help us to understand the age of onset of schizophrenia? Might pruning become too intense and too prolonged in certain individuals? Might it expose other pre-existing vulnerabilities? And how is it that environment, like stress, in, impinges on uh, the genetic pathways like C4. And we're also wanting to now move from the visual system that we love so much into much more uncharted territories, which is the prefrontal cortex. And Mike and, and Mike Carroll is developing mouse models to look at overexpression of multiple copies of human C4A in mice so that we can start to address some of these questions. Now, I'm just going to end in my last slide to try to pull this together, but also to broaden this a bit more. The idea that, you know, although we've been focused on neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric disorders, could this pruning pathway represent a more general common pathway that not only might explain synapse loss during development, but also could it actually also help to understand why synapses are vulnerable in the adult brain, especially in aging and neurodegenerative disease such as Alzheimer's? And so indeed, multiple work now from several labs, including our own, has suggested that this very same pruning pathway that I just told you about becomes aberrantly activated very, very early in Alzheimer's disease models and other models, and that indeed, that this overactivation contributes to synapse loss. And very excitingly, if you block this pathway, either genetically or with antibodies or other mechanisms, you can prevent synapse loss, and in some cases, even some of the cognitive impairment. And so I'll end with this sort of positive, um, sort of hopeful last slide that suggests that maybe by understanding detailed mechanisms by which complement and microglia are selectively targeting synapses in these various models, could this help us to try to identify new targets to to particularly manipulate synapse loss in the right time and the right place? And could it also identify new biomarkers for some of these disorders? So I'll just end there by thanking a lot of individuals, uh, past and present lab members, incredible collaborators, um, and of course, um, generous funding. Thanks so much. <laughs>